Father, this room is a mixture of emotions. It's a mixture of people on different levels in their walk with you. But one thing we have in common, oh God, is that we're loved by you. And we all have been brought by you into this place. Regardless, Lord, of the lives that we have lived this week, or the thoughts that we have thought, we have been brought by your spirit to experience the same love, to experience a transformation. Something, Lord, that people on this earth rarely experience. So, Lord, it is our desire that today something magnificent would happen and that the fire from heaven would come down in this place. And that we would declare with one voice, the Lord is the God. The Lord, he is the God. That there would be a revival in your people, O oh Lord. That we would go from this place, not even wanting to be the same fighting with a desperation to please you, motivated by the love that has been revealed through your word. Take away my fears, O oh Lord, that I would mess up your work. May your glory be seen today. In the name of Jesus, I thank you. Let all God's people say, amen. 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 Thank you, Lord, for hearing that prayer. I was speaking to my brother, and I talk to him often, my twin brother. Um, he's a member of this church, if you didn't know. I like to say that, because that's a powerful man in the Lord. Amen. And um, I was speaking to him. He goes to the seminary, Andrews University. He's going to graduate very shortly with his master's degree. And I'm going to start calling him, well, I already call him Pastor T already. <laughs> well, that's a funny thought, isn't it, Tim? In our group, when we used to hang out, he was probably the craziest, uh, wild man. He was a demoniac. Um, but the Lord took the demoniac and made him a preacher. Will somebody say amen? amen? Even in the story, he said, don't come with me. You're going to be a preacher. Go tell everyone else what I did for you. And so my brother, he was a demoniac, but now he's Pastor T. So Pastor T tells me what's going on in the seminary and what is going on with our professors that are teaching the upcoming ministers. And what I hear is very discouraging. Now, he used to tell me what's going on in the colleges and PUC. He went to PUC and, and the theology professors, what they were teaching there. And I said to myself, that's California. I know this is a battleground. This is the front lines of the great controversy, if you didn't know that. And it's very liberal in California. But so when he shared with me what's happening in the headquarters of our faith, where all our ministers go to get educated, I'm very discouraged. And I'm not going to discourage you with all the news. But he told me, and I shared with Elder Hall, one of the most recent things that's coming up. Uh, the professors are uh, expounding to the students that there's nowhere in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy that there will exist a last generation on this earth who will live victoriously and there will always be in heaven a mediator. Now, in the Bible, yeah, brother, that's what I said. Now, in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, it's crystal clear that there will exist a time when there will be no mediator in heaven, which means we will have to stand before God without fault. So in essence, what the professor is expounding upon without outwardly saying it is that we won't get the victory over sin. By him saying that there's always going to be a mediator, he's saying we will never get the victory over sin. There's so many things I can talk to you about that, that are signs and evidences that we are living at the very threshold of the coming of the Lord. And what I just talked about is one of many. One of many. Go with me to the book of Revelation. What book did I say? Revelation. Revelation. Revelation, Revelation chapter 13. No victory over sin. Revelation chapter 13. And when you get there, say amen. amen. Now, I hope you're ready to study. We're going to study a little bit Revelation 13. And God wants to make sure you understand this thing because we as a people have been given this message to teach and preach. Would somebody say amen? amen. And it's a, a lot of the times we hear these things, but 
it's a different thing when it's time to teach it. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11. Revelation 13, 11. Are we there? Notice what the Bible says. I'm going to be asking you questions, and I would really love for you to respond with an answer. All right? Everybody except the elders. Amen. <laughs> including the ones, including you, brother, especially you. You've been ordained. Don't say a word. Amen. All right. Revelation 13, verse 11. Let's read. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the what? And he had how many horns? Like a what? And he spake as a what? Who is this beast in verse 11? Say it again, sister. It's the United States. Everybody say the United States. All right. So verse 11 is the United States. We're learning. If you want to take some notes, take some notes, because we're going to do a little studying in the beginning. Verse 12. And he exercised. Who's the he in verse 12? The United States. Okay, just follow us. You got to be sna- quick, quick and snappy this morning. And he exerciseth all the power of the what beast? First beast. Who's the first beast? Pages. Say it again, sister. She's going to have all the answers for you, so just look to her when I... <laughs> no, no, keep speaking. The papacy. Who's the first beast? Okay, who's the beast that comes out of the earth? The United States. Okay, verse 12. And he, the United States, exercises all the power of the papacy before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, the papacy, whose deadly wound was healed. Verse 13. And he, who's the he here? It's still speaking in context of the U.S. Are you with me this morning? All right. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Now, I'm going to take a time out here because it's saying that the United States is going to do miracles and then deceive people on the earth by those miracles to kind of honor the beast. But. Let's make it clear with using another scripture that it's not really talking about the United States doing miracles, but something within the United States. Hold your finger there. And where are we going, Tim? All right. Amen. See, and that's that's probably. No, I may ask you another question, brother. Revelation 19 and verse 20. Revelation 19, verse 20. This is how we study the Bible. Would somebody say amen? Amen. Now look at verse 20 and we're going to go back to Revelation 13. Revelation 19, 20, and the beast was taken, and with him the, what does that say? Say it again. That wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. So according to this verse, who's the one who does the miracles? Say it again. Okay, now look at Revelation chapter 13 and verse 13. And he doeth wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So who's doing the wonders? The false prophet. You get it? Okay. Now verse 14. No, no. Let's just go to verse 15. Now let's study a little bit more. You ready? And he, speaking of the false prophet, had power To give life, that word life literally means spirit. It's the same word as spirit. He has power to give life or spirit unto the image of the beast. Time out. Let me ask you a question. What is the image of the beast? I heard Sunday law. Any other answers? I can't hear you. Sunday sacredness. Okay, let me ask you a question then. If the image of the beast is the Sunday law, then what's the difference between the image of the beast and the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast and the image of the beast are two separate things. They both can't be the Sunday law. Praise God for this lesson. Would somebody say amen? Amen. This is why it's, we're, we're teaching, and, uh, teaching this thing right now, okay? So here's how you understand what the Word of God is saying. First of all, we have the first beast, the United States. Then we have the papacy, which is actually the first beast. The United States is the second beast, amen? amen. Now, there's an entity within the United States called the false prophet. 
the false prophet is going to be doing miracles and deceiving everybody to honor the papacy. Are you with me this morning? Now, it says in verse 15, the false prophet is the entity that has power to give life unto the image of the beast. It's not the beast. It's the image of the beast. Let, let me explain. Here we go. I love it. I love the answers. Here we are. So the word image literally means likeness. It's, it's like the word of a reflection. So if I'm looking in the mirror, I see my image. Just pretend I'm the beast. And pray, uh, that's, mom was like, no, don't do that. I'm not. <laughs> Just pretend. <laughs> Just pretend. I'm the papacy and I look in the mirror, I see my image. That's the image of the beast. You with me? The image is not the actual thing. It's separate. Are you listening to me? Now let's, let, now let's notice what the, the, if you notice what the beast looks like, then you know what the image looks like. Are you following me? Because it's a reflection of the beast. Now, I'm just going to use the word of God. Is that okay? So let's stay in the chapter. Let's figure out what the beast looks like, the papacy, and then we'll know what the image looks like. Revelation 13, verse 1 is a description of the beast, the papacy. And now, I'm not going to break down the whole chapter. There's a lot we can go to, but I'm just going to stay with verse 1. You ready? And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the what, everyone? Having how many heads? And how many horns? And upon his horns were how many crowns? And upon his heads, the name of what? Wow. This is, the, this is what the beast looks like. Seven heads, ten horns. On these horns, there's crowns. And upon this beast is the names of what? Now, it's literally in the plural. It's not the name of blasphemy. It's the names of blasphemy in the original language. Now, let's, let's, this is what the beast looks like. Seven heads, ten horns. Now, just to be brief... A beast in Bible prophecy, according to Daniel chapter 7, represents what? Kingdoms or nations, right? Kingdoms or nations. So you know that this beast represents a conglomerate of nations. So there's seven heads, ten horns. Here's what it represents. A conglomerate, an amalgamation of worldly political powers. In short, all these things, the seven heads, ten horns, represents a conglomerate of state power. What kind of power? That's all it represents. We don't have time to get into all the nitty gritty, but, but just to make it plain, the seven heads and ten horns represents the unification of the world, the state powers, the political powers. If that's clear, let me hear you say amen. amen. So here you have a state power. That's what beasts represent, states and the horns, the unification of the world. Seven and ten. But also this beast has the names of what? Now, blasphemy is now stepping from the realm of political and state powers into religious. Do you see that? But let's specify what kind of religion are we talking about here. The names of blasphemy. Now, you know these scriptures. You may want to write them down. But according to the Bible, blasphemy has some definitions. John 10, 33 says it's blasphemous when a man claims to be God. Mark 2, verse 7 says it's blasphemous when a man claims to forgive sins. But here's one we really don't go to too much. Hold your finger and let's go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 9. I can't say I've ever heard somebody go to this one, but I, this is very important that we go to this one because I think that when you, when you open the book of Revelation, we would be mistaken not to use Revelation to help to interpret Revelation. Are you with me this morning? All right. So Revelation 2 verse 9. Are we there? I know thy works and tribulation, we're getting a definition of blasphemy, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the what, everyone? Of them which say they are what? And are what? But are of the synagogue of who? Have mercy. So according to this verse, what's the definition of blasphemy? What is it? Just to save time, elders. In the Bible, a Jew is what for us? God's people, his church, a Christian. It's a what, everyone? A Christian, right? So the definition of blasphemy, according to this verse, is when somebody claims to be a Christian, but really they're not. Are you with me this morning? So let's go back to Revelation 13, verse 1. We're just getting an idea of what the beast looks like. So far, we understand that he has seven heads and ten horns. This is a political state power. What kind of power? 
state power. Everybody say state power. Now this state power, not only has all the world mingled up with it, it also has blasphemy written all over it. And we understand that blasphemy is when a Christian claims to be a Christian, but really is not. Would you say amen? amen. So the beast looks like a state power mingled up with church power that claims to be Christian, but really isn't. So it's an amalgamation of church and state. Do you see that in Revelation 13 verse 1? If that's clear, let me hear you say amen. amen. So that's what the beast looks like, an amalgamation of all the worldly powers, ten heads, I mean seven heads, ten horns, blasphemous, they claim to be Christian, but they're really not. It's an amalgamation, they're mixed together, that's what the beast looks like. Now go back to Revelation 13 verse 15. And he, who's the he again in this verse? Revelation 13 verse 15, and he had power, who's the he? The false prophet, are you with me this morning? The false prophet had power to give life unto the image of the beast. So the image of the beast is this. If the beast is church and state, then the image of the beast is. Somebody say praise the Lord. Do you see that now? The beast is church and state. So the image is church and state. Are you listening to me? So the false prophet has power to bring about church and state, let's continue to read, that the image of the beast or church and state should both speak. Now, whenever a nation speaks, it means it passes laws, amen? So this church and state government will pass laws, should both speak and cause, that means enforce the law, that as many as would not worship or obey, this church and state system should be what? Can you see that in the word of God this morning? So the image of the beast is what, everyone? Say it like you believe it. It's what? Now, now you know the difference between the image of the beast and the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is the Sunday law enforced. The image of the beast enforces the mark of the beast. Are you with me this morning? Now, God has told me to teach you this. Because we have the third angel's message, and when the, within the third angel's message, we are warning people not to take the mark of the beast. Right. Which means we got to teach Revelation 13. Would somebody say amen? amen. But that's not the point of the, the, the message this morning. I just wanted you to, to understand that it's the false prophet. It's who, everyone? The false prophet. That gives birth, that makes way, that makes it possible, that gives life to this church and state system that ends up persecuting the saints. So let me ask you a question now. Who in the world, because look, we all living in the United States, hello, who in the world is this false prophet? Well, apostate Protestantism, that is the answer. That is, that is the broad answer. It's not the Pope, because you know why? The Pope, he's, he's tied in with the beast, the first beast that comes out of the sea. The false prophet, apostate Protestantism, that is the broad answer. That's the broad answer. You ready for the in-depth, detailed answer? Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And say amen when you get there. Let's notice what Jesus says, our Lord and our Savior, when he talks about the false prophet. And when you get to Matthew 7, just remember, it's the false prophet that breathes life into church and state here in this country. Are you listening to me this morning? Yeah. All right. Apostate Protestantism is the answer, but we're going to put a magnifying glass on what that is. You ready? Matthew chapter 7, and look with me at verse 15. Are you there? Amen. Beware of who? Uh-oh. Which come to you in, in what kind of clothing? clothing? Have mercy. But inwardly they are what? Now, a sheep in the Bible represents what? A Christian. The scripture reading this morning was John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Anybody a follower of Christ? That means you're a sheep. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. That means David saying, I'm a sheep. You get it? So these false prophets are clothed in garments of Christianity, but inwardly they are what? Now watch what Jesus says is the definition of a wolf. You ready? 
He goes on in verse 16. Ye shall know them. Who's the them? The wolves, a.k.a. the false prophets. You get what I'm saying? So the false prophets in Revelation 13 are also known as wolves. They're also known as what, everyone? Okay, we're getting we're getting somewhere. So we're going to skip a little bit down. We're familiar that Jesus then says in verse 16 that these wolves, they don't bring forth good fruit. They bring forth bring forth bad fruit. Amen. Then he continues. Look at verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that what everyone do with the will of my father, which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Here it is. Here's the key. Here's the key. And then will I profess unto them. He's talking about these wolves. I never knew you. Depart from me. Ye that work what? Now what's the Greek word for that again? Does anybody remember? No, no, no. In that verse. Um, what is it, Lord? Anomai or anime. Anomia. 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 There it is. Now that work, anomia, no, anomia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. I'm just going to say anomia and anomia, okay? So that word literally means lawlessness. What does it mean? Lawlessness. lawlessness. Now here's the root of what a wolf is. It's somebody who practices lawlessness. What's lawlessness? 1 John 3 verse 4, Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the what? For sin is the transgression of the You know what word is used there? It's the same word. Anomia. Anomia. It's the same word. Lawlessness. So that in 1 John 3, 4, it literally reads this. Whosoever committed sin is lawless. For sin is lawlessness. You know what a wolf does? I'm going to make it plain. A wolf is somebody who does not get the victory over sin. Did you hear me this morning? Amen. If you keep the commandments, you know what that means? Victory over sin. Amen. If you break the commandments, the definition of breaking commandments is sin. If you're living lawless, you're not getting the victory over sin. This is powerful because here's what the Bible is saying. A wolf is somebody who's not getting the victory, who's not in the fight to get the victory over sin. And Jesus says that they're false prophets. These wolves, those who are not getting the victory, are going to be responsible in Revelation chapter 13 for breathing life into the image of the beast. You're not listening to me this morning. We think of the false prophet, oh, the Baptists, the Pentecostals, the Lutherans, everyone who don't have the three angels message, they're the ones who's going to start the image of the beast in the United States. No, that's not what Jesus says. If you're not overcoming sin, you're a wolf. Now, let me make it plain, because I know that's strong. I, but we living in the last days. If you're, if you're practicing fornication, I'm not talking about slipping and tripping and falling and making a mistake. I'm talking about practicing fornication and you're coming into the sanctuary, but you're living a lawless life. You're a wolf. And if you keep living that way, you are going to be responsible for breathing life into the image of the beast. We can go ahead and shake your hand and say thank you for adding to the resurrection of the papacy. Thank you for making way for the persecuting power that's going to come after me and my kids. You're practicing idolatry. Come on. Come on. You spend more of your time doing everything else except your face in this book. Amen. Come on. Come on. You're wrestling. You know, there's a difference between wrestling with addiction and not even trying to overcome. Come on. Come on. Now, I'm going to make it plain. I'm not talking about people wrestling and fighting to overcome. Would you say amen? amen. There's a difference. There's a difference. If you're a young youth in here and your thoughts are rebellious to your parents, constantly, I hate them, I can't wait to get out, you're breaking the fifth commandment, you are a wolf in sheep's clothing. If you have hatred in your heart for the one next to you, unforgiveness, the Bible says if you have hatred in your heart, that's murder. 
You're breaking the sixth commandment. You're a wolf. And by you harboring onto those feelings, you are, you are living a lawless life and your spirit, now watch this, the false prophet gives spirit to the beast. Your, listen, listen to me, listen to me. The papacy, that power is a body that's dead. A body needs a spirit. And in your spirit is going to feed that body to bring about the resurrection of the abomination of desolation. By our lawless lifestyle. I meant to teach, not preach. The sheep's clothing seems so real, so genuine. I'm reading the spirit of prophecy that the wolf cannot be discerned. Only, only, only as we go to God's great moral standard and there find that they are transgressors of the law of Jehovah. Are you a wolf this morning? What's going on in the secret places of your mind? What's going on in your homes? If you're living a lawless life, and again, I'm not talking about those who are struggling. I'm talking about those who are living the way they're living and not caring. God says, I don't know you. Depart from me, ye that work lawlessness. You know what? This blew me out my seat. I didn't know that I could be responsible for bringing forth the image of the beast. I didn't know I had a, I had a part in that. You know, there's only two spirits that will fully develop in, in the last days. Two, two spirits that will fully develop into maturity in the last days. The Bible calls them the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. Now, Paul talks about the mystery of iniquity in 2 Thessalonians, I believe, chapter 2, verse 7. And he says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. You know what that means? That word iniquity is the same word, anomia, lawlessness. The mystery of a law lawlessness was already in Paul's day. You know what that spirit is? It's the spirit that attacks the fundamental principle of victory over sin. That's what the spirit or the mystery of iniquity is. So Paul is like, hold on a second. This spirit is invading the church right now, convincing the flock that they can't get the victory over sin. The spirit of lawlessness. Now I'm going to show you in the scripture that this spirit of lawlessness was in the church in Jesus' days. And I'm going to show you who it was with and what they were responsible for bringing because they didn't get the victory. Are you ready? Matthew chapter 23. Where are we going? Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And we're going to look at verse 27. Say amen when you get there. Matthew 23. Now, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the people that he gave the Ten Commandments to, the people that he gave the Sabbath to, the people that he gave the sanctuary message to, the people that he gave a health message to, the people that he gave a dress reform message to. Are you listening to me this morning? Now, notice what he says in verse 27. Thou, I'm sorry, woe unto you. Scribes and Pharisees. What's that next word? Now, I counted the amount of times he called them hypocrites in this chapter. And guess how many times he called them hypocrites? Seven times. They had perfected the art of acting because hypocrite, the word hypocrite means actor. So they were perfect actors. In other words, they were wearing that sheep's wool really good and nobody could tell the difference. Hypocrites. For ye are like whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of what, everyone? And of all what? This is the same language of Matthew 7, 15. How the false prophet is clothed in sheep's clothing, but inwardly is a ravening wolf. He's just describing it in a different way. The same person, the same false prophet is being described. Here's how I know. Look at the very next verse. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous and unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy. And what else? Lawlessness. In other words, Jesus is saying, hold on. You look good on the outside, but you're not getting the victory over sin. You're still living a lawless lifestyle. 
Now notice what the conclusion of that lifestyle is. Look with me at verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And if you want to be real, you can put your name there. Come on. At times I put my name. Oh, Adam, oh, Adam. Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. Now, here's what Jesus is saying. In previous chapters, he was telling the Pharisees, I kept sending you my prophets with my word to correct your ways. You know what the prophets are? It's the word of God. Every book in here is a prophet. And every book in here is meant to correct you and turn you from your ways. And so what he's saying to the Pharisees, I sent you prophet after prophet with my word to correct, to convict, to turn, to revive. But you would not. How many times do we have to come to church? Are you listening to me? To be convicted by the words of the prophets, but to walk out unchanged. You know what Jesus is saying? I'm sending you the words of the prophets every Sabbath when the elders stand up here, every Sabbath when the pastor stands up here, he declares the words of the prophets. Are you receiving the word of God to be transformed? Or are you being conformed to the world? Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. That means a born again experience must take place. How does it take place? First Peter chapter two, verse 23. Watch this. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. God is saying, I'm giving you the words of life every Sabbath. I give you the words of the prophets every Sabbath so that you can take it home and experience a new birth. Would somebody say amen? amen. To be cleansed from the inside out. Now notice what these Pharisees did. They rejected him. Verse, re, they rejected Christ. Verse 37. Thou that killest the prophets, stonest them, which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Verse 38. Behold, your house is left Unto you, how? Have mercy. Now, when he said that, it had two implications. How many implications? Now, here's the first one. He's in the temple. He's where, everyone? He's in the temple. Jesus himself is in the temple. Let me ask you a question. Is Jesus in your temple today? Is Jesus in your temple today? He's in the temple speaking to the Pharisees. I'm trying to give you my word. You rejected my word over. Now I'm here myself, ready to give you all that I have to offer. And now you're rejecting me. I have no choice now but to leave your temple desolate. You know what the servant of the Lord says? That Christ is the glory of God. He is the Shekinah. He is the character of God. So when he left that temple, perfect, the perfect character of God left that temple never to return. Their house was desolate, uninhabited, empty. You know what the Bible says happens if your temple is empty? Do you remember what happens? Matthew, yeah, Matthew 12. Let's check it out. Matthew 12. Matthew 12. Matthew 12. Matthew 12, verse 43. Matthew 12, verse 43. Say amen when you get there. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it what, everyone? He findeth it what? Swept and garnished. Watch this. Then goeth he and taketh with himself, how many? Perfect possession here. Seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Now watch this. I never paid attention to the last sentence. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. He prophesied before they even rejected him, saying, you're going to reject me. And because you reject me, you're going to be demon possessed to the fullest. Isn't that amazing? You know what, you know what we say? Man, I know the truth, Lord. There's no way in the world I'm going to support the Sunday law. But if you don't get the victory over sin, Christ is saying, you know what? I'm knocking right now. 
That's why in Revelation chapter 3, he's outside the door. He's not inside. He's outside trying to get in. But if you don't open a door, he's going to turn around and say, your house is left unto you desolate. And then what's going to happen to you? You say, you say I'm not going to support the Sunday law, but I bet you when you become demon possessed, you will. You sure will. You're going to be front. You're going to be first person in the line supporting this thing. That's the first application. Go with me to Matthew 23 again. When he said your house is left unto you desolate, he not only meant that I will leave after a certain while of pleading. This is what he meant also. You're going to be responsible for the desolation that will occur in this city. Because in the very next chapter, Matthew 24, he leaves the temple, he goes to Mount Olives, and then he starts to talk about the desolation that's going to come to Jerusalem. And whose fault was it? The Pharisees that were... Your house, now notice this, this is powerful. When he came to the temple in Matthew 21, he said, this is my father's house. But at the end of Matthew 23, he said, it ain't my father's house no more, this is your house. I got nothing to do with this. I'm out of here. And then in Matthew 24, verse 15, notice what it says. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. This is, this is the desolation that they were responsible for. The abomination of desolation. Now we, we read in Luke 21, 20, that the abomination of desolation was the armies of Rome. So here's what Jesus is saying. Because you refuse to be changed by my word. Because you refuse me. I have to leave now. And now you're responsible for the destruction that comes upon this place. And I started to think, you know, who was responsible for bringing the desolation of the flood? Think about it. The sons of God begin to live a lawless life. Are you listening to me this morning? They were not getting the victory anymore. This is so powerful. They begin to conform to the world. And here's why I know the issue, and always is the issue, is victory over sin. Nobody was getting the victory, and here's how I know why. Peter calls Noah, who lived during that time, a preacher of righteousness. A preacher of what? Now, I was like, what does that mean? The Bible says in Psalms 119, 172, all thy commandments are righteousness. What's righteousness? All his commandments. So if Noah was a preacher of righteousness, what was he preaching? Okay, now let's, just make, let's make this even more practical. The Bible also says in Genesis 6 verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now what does it mean to find grace? Hebrews 4 verse 16. Watch this now. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace to, no, to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Noah found grace. There's only one way to find grace, and that's at the throne of mercy. Are you with me this morning? So here's what the Bible is saying. Now in Hebrews 4.16, it's specifically talking about victory over sin. It's saying Jesus was weak. He overcame, so therefore we can go to the throne of grace and obtain that same power so that we can overcome. So Noah found this same grace. Noah found this same power to overcome, and hence he lived righteously. So you know what Noah was preaching? He was preaching about his experience. He was preaching about his victory over sin. He was preaching about the righteousness of God's law because he was experiencing the power, overcoming sin, and he had something to talk about. Will somebody say amen? amen? But here was the problem. It was only him and his household. That wasn't enough to save the destruction of the earth. Now notice this. Why was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? Who was responsible for the desolation of Sodom and Gomorrah? We, we, we say this all the time, and we're true. They were wicked. They practiced some horrible sins. Yes, but did you know God wanted to spare Sodom and Gomorrah? Remember that conversation in Genesis chapter 18 with Abraham and Jesus? And Abraham said, Jesus, are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? In other words, he's saying, 
Are you going to destroy those who are trying to overcome sin? Righteous, the commandment keepers. Are you going to destroy those who are trying to get the victory with those who are not? Are you going to destroy the wolves with the sheep? What did Jesus say? And they went on this bargaining thing. If there's 40 righteous, if there's 40 people trying to get the victory, you're going to destroy. They went all the way down to 10. And Jesus said this. If there's 10 righteous, if there's 10 sheep, if there's 10 people trying to get the victory over sin, I will not destroy it. There weren't 10 Christians in there trying to get the victory over sin, and therefore the desolation came. The Bible says ye are the salt of the earth. What does is, what is salt do, folks? It preserves. What color is salt? What does white represent? Righteousness. You are the salt of the earth. As long as you're getting the victory over sin, you are preserving that image of the beast from rising up. But there was no salt in Sodom. There was no salt in the days of Noah. Therefore, the desolation came. Are you with me this morning? Amen. Here's what Jesus wants to do. Here's what he's pleading with us. I'm going to read this quote. It says, Jesus wants us to show to the world that there is in the gospel power to enable human beings to gain the victory yeah, over yeah, sin. Yeah. That's what the gospel is all about. Revelation 14, verse 1, it describes the 144,000, and on their forehead is written what? The, the name of the Father. Amen? If you need to go there, go there. Revelation 14, verse 1. On their foreheads is written. That means these people have, they demonstrate the character of God in its fullest. Are you listening to me? They demonstrate the character of God, which is his law. When Jesus made that proclamation to the Pharisees, these people said, no, Lord Jesus, we want to be transformed. Please stay in our temple and sup with us. Would somebody say amen? Amen. But the question now becomes, how do we obtain the character of God? Revelation chapter 3. Where are we going? Revelation chapter 3. I don't know about you, but I don't want nothing to do with resurrecting the image of the beast. I want to show the world and Satan the power of the gospel. Revelation chapter 3, verses 10. Now, many of us are not aware that when the Bible talks about the church of Philadelphia, it's describing the 144,000. Did you know that? Yes. The church of Philadelphia, it describes 144,000. Notice the question is, how do we obtain the character of God? Verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon how much of the world? How much of the world? There's only one big temptation that's going to come upon all the world, and that's the Sunday law crisis. To try them that dwell upon the what? Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Pay attention now. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my who, everyone? Now, who's speaking here? This is Jesus speaking. It better be read in your Bible. Jesus is speaking, and he's saying, I'm going to write upon him the name of my God. This is the Father's name that's written on the foreheads of those who stand on Mount Zion in Revelation 14, verse 1. If that's clear, let me hear you say amen. amen. Now, the question is, how or why did he write the name? It's the first three words of verse 12. What does it say? He that overcometh. Do you see that? The person that overcomes then receives that stamp, the character of God. So the next question becomes, how did they overcome? Would you like to know this morning? I know I would. Look at Revelation 3, same chapter, and verse 21. Revelation 3, 21. To him that, what's that word? Overcome. Revelation 3, 21. We're in the same chapter. Will I grant to sit with me in my what? Here's the key. 
even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So according to this verse, how must we overcome? Say it again. As Jesus overcame. Now I'm going to read two quotes to you. The first one is going to explain clearly how Jesus overcame. Are you ready? He exercised manuscript 141, 1901. He exercised in his own behalf no power which man cannot exercise. As man, he met temptation and overcame in the strength given him of God. He did the same thing Noah did. He found grace. Are you listening to me this morning? He gives us an example of perfect obedience. He has provided that we may become partakers of the divine nature and assures us that we may overcome as he overcame. His life testified that by, by the aid of the same divine power which Christ received, it is possible, it is what everyone? Possible. For man to obey God's law. Now I'm gonna read another quote. And it was very similar to what you read this morning, Elder. And what you talked about pretty much is very similar to what's going on. The Holy Ghost is real. Notice what she says, just to, just to balance this all out. You ready? To follow Christ is not freedom from conflict. When you cry out to God for help, don't expect magic to happen. Did you hear what I'm saying? Don't expect, this is, this is, not, this is not witchcraft and spiritualism. Don't expect magical things to happen. Are you listening to me? To follow Christ is not freedom from conflict. It is not child's play. It is not spiritual idleness. All the enjoyment. How much of the enjoyment? People say, where do we get our joy from? All the enjoyment in Christ's service means sacred obligations in meeting oft stern conflicts. What kind of conflicts? To follow Christ means stern battles. What kind of battles? Active labor. Warfare against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Our enjoyment is the victories gained for Christ in earnest, hard warfare. Think of this. Did you hear what she said? The first quote, she said, Jesus overcame by depending on the power of the Father. Then she balances it out and says, this is not child's play. It's going to be a stern battle. It's going to be a warfare. But we get the enjoyment once we overcome and are victorious in his name. Some of us wondering why we don't have any joy. Have you got any victory? This is from the Upward Look, page 217. Now, let me tell you a story. I know that I thought about you. Every time I see that, brother, I think about you. That's his book. Let me make it plain. February was Super Bowl month. Now... The team that I grew up and was obsessed with since a kid was in the Super Bowl playing. And I tell the Lord, Lord, how come they always making it in? Is this a test for me all the time? I'm tired of it. And I did my best, babe, I did, not to watch the football season. And I'm gonna confess I was guilty. I may have watched one or two games, hello. Or, or the quick scores on Sports Center where they pretty much show you the whole game anyhow. <laughs> Cheating. Come on. And so when the Super Bowl came, I don't know how this happened, I'm in my house all by myself. I don't know where my wife was at that time. And the TV was there, have mercy. So you know, I do what I do. When it's time for war, I'm walking around. You can't leave a man in the house with the TV, no kids around, and it's Super Bowl Sunday. And your team is in the Super Bowl. Yeah, mercy. And so I'm, I'm going through a war. I'm talking about what it means to be a Christian. So I, you know, I quickly, as we do when we sin, quickly grab the remote, plop on the couch, and in one smooth motion, the TV's on before my butt hits the seat. <laughs> and I'm just, man, let me just see what's going on. But as I started to watch the game, and I'm talking to the men, this is with the game, this is with the fight, any competitive sport. As I started to watch the game, feelings within me started to rise up. This anxiety, this, 
you know that feeling that you get. And your, your team ain't even playing and you still get that feeling. So you imagine how I felt. This, this irritability, this frustration, this impatience. You know, you, it's impossible to fight that when you're watching that. Impossible. So I'm sitting there wrestling with the flesh and I'm wrestling and, and, and it's barely through the first quarter and then the commercials are coming on and I'm getting convicted. I'm feeling, it's the, it was the most miserable experience. You know why I was miserable? Because I was praying to the Lord previously and I still pray, Lord, take this out of my mind. Take this out of my heart. Make me hate this stuff. If you pray that prayer, he will start to put that burden on you. He will, the, he will put that woe on you. If you like watching these shows and you love it, ask him to put a hatred in your heart for it. Then all of a sudden when you turn it on, you'll be like, oh man, this, this don't feel right. This, it's, it's, a, it's a guilt, a burden. And that's the strength of the Lord leading you to repentance. So I was sitting there like, you know, I, I, like I had the itch or something. I couldn't be still. And it got to the point, the Lord is saying, is that my character that's within you right now? Is that my character that's welling up within you? This, this irritability, this impatience, and this, ah, I want to get in the game. Is that my character? No, Lord, it's not your character. What are you doing? You want to be a part of this number that you preach about? And one of the hardest things I had, I'm talking about stern battles this morning, church. This was a stern battle for me. It wasn't a pleasant experience. But I love the Lord. But in that moment, that thing had a power over my heart. Power. It had a power because it was so hard for me to turn it off. And it shouldn't be that way between me and my God. Nothing should have power over me except the Lord and my beautiful wife. But I wrestled. Before the first quarter turn off, I turn off the TV. But listen, I have to find grace now. I have to find grace because I'm weak. Don't just turn it off and just be like, I'm going to do it. No. You know what? I, I turn off the TV and I ran like a little girl into the closet. And, I'm not, I'm not, and I was wrestling in the closet for the, pretty much the whole Super Bowl. I'm praying to God. I would go in the closet. Lord, help me, Lord. It's not all the way out my system. I, and I'm sorry, and I was pleading and agonizing and, 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 and just getting super emotional for him to take it away. Then I would stop praying, get out the closet, and that overwhelming urge to turn on the TV would come back on, and I would roll right back into the closet. Let me, let me, let me tell you something. You know what we do? We pray to God, oh, we, we agonize, we whine, we go out, and because we don't feel the power, we say, okay, God must not be tripping then. <laughs> Mercy. It, it must be okay. Mercy. That's right. You know, do you know that there's a, tra I'm going to go off a little bit on a tangent, but bear with me. There's a transgender elder in the Seventh-day Adventist church. He gave his testimony. And you know what his testimony was? I prayed and I cried out to God to take it away from me, and he didn't. So that must mean God is okay with my lifestyle. Lord, have mercy. Help us. Help us. Let me make this plain to you. When the Bible talks about stern battles, think about Jesus. If Jesus had to wrestle in the Garden of Gethsemane for hours to the point where he sweated blood and he was the son of God without sin, what thinks you can get, get away with just a little 10 minute prayer to get the victory? We ain't agonizing. Ain't nobody. Have you shed a tear? You know, the, you know, the Lord showed me and I've been sharing this because it's revolutionary to me. The Lord never healed anybody that didn't want to be desperately healed. That's right. Amen. That is true. That's right. That is the elder touched on it this morning. That is true. John chapter 5, that man at the pool of Bethesda. Jesus walked by how many people that were sick? Why did he choose that man? That man was crippled for 38 years. Now let me talk about this man was so tired of his condition. He was tired of being crippled. You know how I know that? Because every time that pool rippled, he would do that army crawl to try and get in, and he would never make it in. Someone else would always beat him to the pool. But did he get discouraged and leave? He got discouraged, but did he leave? No. Did he give up his effort? No. Did he stay on his elbows and try and try and try? And Jesus said, this one wants to be healed. This one wants to be clean. This one wants to be made whole. And he walks up to him and says, will thou be made whole? Come on now. Come on now. That's right. In Mark chapter 1, there was a leper. There was many lepers. But there was one leper 
who said, I'm not going to stay in this leprosy hole. I'm not going to stay amongst other lepers, amongst other people who are discouraged, amongst other people who are in this condition. I'm tired of being in this condition. I'm getting out of here and I'm going to the master. I don't care about the rocks that are being thrown at me. I don't care about the stairs. I don't care about what anyone else has to say. I'm going to Jesus. And that man, because he was persistent, said, Master, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. The Bible says Jesus was moved with compassion and said unto him, I will. Because you want it. You cried out to me for it. In Mark chapter 10, is a blind man, blind Bartimaeus. He's sitting outside the city. Watch this now. Outside of Jericho. He heard that Jesus was in the atmosphere. And when he heard Jesus was in the atmosphere, he said, I'm tired of being blind. I'm tired of being in this condition. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. You know what the people around him told him to do? They said, shut your mouth. Be quiet. You're making a noise. And guess what? Here's what's powerful. Jesus heard him the first time. Yes, right. That's right. That's right. Jesus walked by him. He cried out, Jesus, thou son of David. Jesus did not turn around. He kept walking. How bad do you want to be changed? Are you tired of your sinful ways? Are you tired of making the Lord's name a mess in this earth? Are you tired of misrepresenting his character? How much do you love him? How much are you going to agonize to be changed? They told him to be quiet. Was he quiet? The Bible says he cried out even more. Jesus, thou son of David. Then I can see Jesus now smiling. Yes, he called upon me again. Then he turns around and heals the man. In Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, there was a man who couldn't walk. Four of his friends brought him to Capernaum, and Jesus was teaching, and the house was packed. They tried to get in. They tried to cry out to Jesus, but it was too packed. Did he go home? Did he say, hey, hey friends, we tried. We cried out to God to help us and heal my lame, sinful condition. It's too bad. You know what he says? He said, no, nah, brother, we're going to tear that roof off. Tear that roof off. Are you tearing the roof off with your prayers? Are you wrestling with God saying, don't let me go until you bless me? Are we being like Jacob and God saying, we're not doing it. That's right. We're not desperate enough. We're not desperate enough. The woman with the issue with blood, I can go on. She tried everything. She was desperate to be changed. Desperate. Spent all her money to be different. She no longer wanted to be in her sin. No longer wanted to think the way she thought, acted the way she acted. And so she did that army crawl too. Through the crowd, embarrassed herself just to touch the hem of his garment. Yes, Amen. And everybody, how many people? Everybody. Everybody who agonizes before the Lord in that manner will receive the hand of the master. That is key to victory over sin. How bad do you want to be different? How bad do you? And if you don't have that within you, ask God to put it in you and he will. Ask him to do it. I guarantee you he'll do it. Man, I can tell you about the. I'm going to keep going. Forgive me, church. When I, the last time I went to the movie theaters, I've been praying to the Lord. Take it out of my heart to even be here. Last time I went to the movie theaters to watch a movie that I like, the superhero movies and stuff, I went in that place and it felt like I was in, on yeah. Satan's ground. Yeah. It felt like the Lord tore the veil for me and I actually got scared. Yeah. And I was sat there and I was looking at the people and everybody was looking mesmerized as if they were getting mind controlled. And they were. And I was scared, like, and I felt like I was in the atmosphere of demons. And then what made it even worse, to kick a man when he's down, what I was watching on the screen, they started, at that moment, they started to mock the Lord in that very moment. And I felt so ashamed. I felt so ashamed. And I said, Lord, I'm not going in this place again. I'm tired of not being able to represent your character on this earth. And because he put it within my heart, he did. And he reminded me of how much he's done for me. And I, I love him. But we need to show our love. Amen. And guess what? We don't have the strength to break away from these things. Don't get it twisted. We don't. He has to give us that desire to do it. But we're not asking for it, church. We're not pleading for it. Just plead and ask for it and he'll give it to you. Let's close this thing up. Let's close this thing up. John 10, 27. Last scripture. 
This is what it means to be a sheep. Anybody want to be a sheep this morning? I want to get the victory over sin. I don't want to give the power to the beast. I want to give power to Christ. Will somebody say amen? amen. John 10, 27. Jesus is that good to us, folks. Let's go to our scripture and close this thing up. Here's the definition of a sheep. Here it is. My sheep. What's the next three words? Elder, elder, elder touched on it this morning for Sabbath school. You, you missed it. But if you just, just because you miss it, you're going to get it again right now. My sheep hear my voice. Who wants to be a sheep this morning? What's the voice of God? It's right here. I love what the elder said. The voice of God is not some audible voice that you hear. Oh, yeah, I can hear him. Oh, oh yeah, that's him. I'm familiar with that. No, no. This is how you get familiar with his voice. This is the voice of God, and this is how it works. Here's what God is saying. Jesus is saying, my sheep hear my voice. That means my sheep spend time getting familiar with my voice. When you read his word, that's how you get familiar with his voice. So much so that when you go out into public, the word of God now, which is his voice, begins to direct you with what to say to people. The word of God now directs you with where to go. The word of God now directs you with what to put on, what to eat, because everything is in the word of God. Would somebody say amen? amen? You're so familiar with his voice. Do you know there's a time coming we, we may not have this book? That means you need, to be, you need to store up the word of God. That means be familiar with his voice. Don't be led astray. My sheep spend time in my word. They get familiar with what I'm saying. That's number one. And here's another evidence of that. What does Romans 10, 17 say? So faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yes. This is his voice. And what's the second part? Here it is. And I know them. Yes. Remember in Matthew chapter 7? Yes. What, did he tell, what did he tell the wolves in Matthew chapter 7? I never, I never knew you. Why? Because you never got the victory over sin. Now, he says the same thing in Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. The five foolish, they try to get that oil. They come back and the door is shut. They knock on the door and the bridegroom says, I don't know you. I, I know you not. You know that parable saying? Those people who scramble to get the oil at the end were people who were scrambling to get an experience. What word did I say? Experience. They were trying to get an experience with Christ, but it's too late. Both parables. I know you not, ye workers of iniquity. I know you not for those who are trying to get a last day experience at the last moment. So in order to know Christ, here's what it means. You have an experience with him with getting the victory over sin. Are you following me this morning? You have an experience with him with getting the victory over sin. He says, oh, yeah, I know you. I know you. And last but not least, the first was my sheep spend time in my word. They know my word and I know them. They have an experience with depending on my power to get the victory over sin. And last but not least, and they what? Follow me. They follow him. When Jesus came up to Andrew and Peter, what did he say to him? Follow me. Follow me. And what did they do? They dropped their nets. They dropped their occupation. They left their family. They left everything they knew and fought. They made a sacrifice. They made what, everyone? When Jesus came to Matthew, who wrote the book of Matthew, he was sitting at his tax collector table at his work. Now, Jesus didn't walk up to him and say, hey, I want to introduce you to you myself. My name is Jesus. No, he didn't say none of that. He said two words. He looked at the brother and said, follow me turned around and got, got to walking. What did Matthew do? He left everything, got up and followed Christ. He made the sacrifice. He made the what, everyone? Come on now. Matthew chapter 19, the rich young ruler. What must I do to be saved? Jesus gave him some commandments. He said, I kept these commandments. Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. Sell everything you got. Give it to the poor. You'll have treasures in heaven. And what else did he say? And follow me. Come on now. But he wasn't willing to make the sacrifice of that thing which he loved. Are you willing to sacrifice that which you love the most? To let it go? To let it go and follow? This is what it means to be a sheep. Let's recap. My sheep hear my voice.
They spend time in my word. And I know them. They have an experience with getting the victory over sin. And they follow me. They have sacrificed those things they love the most. And they follow me. Do you want to be a sheep this morning? Do you want to be a sheep this morning? I want you to be encouraged this morning. God knows your weakness. He knows what you're struggling with. Don't, don't walk out of here with your head down. You ought to walk out of here with your head up. Because we still have a Savior who saves. Amen. He came to save you if you're sick. He came to save you if you're lost. If you're healed, you don't need a physician. And Jesus is the physician. Would somebody say amen? amen? He can do the impossible in your life. He wants to do it. All you got to do is open up your mouth and cry out in sincerity. And the Holy Ghost will begin that process to do the rest. Would somebody say amen? amen. This church is a bunch of witnesses in here who have experienced the gospel power of God, and we're still experiencing his power. We have to demonstrate his character on this earth. The fact is, the salt will be few. But let not anyone in Southgate Church be a part of that number that gives life to the image of the beast. Now his sheep, I'm going to close with the last verse, verse 28. Here's the promise to you. Here's the promise to you. You spend time in his word. You depend upon him to get the victory. You sacrifice through his power those things that you love. Verse 28 is yours. And I give unto them what kind of life? Eternal, Eternal life. And they shall never perish. Amen. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Would somebody say amen? amen? Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Father, we thank you. We're encouraged this morning. We're weak, and sometimes, Lord, we don't have the desire to pray. We're praying right now that you would change that in us, that you would give us a desire to cry out, even in the act, oh Lord, after the act, that we would come boldly unto the throne of grace. Please, oh God, give us a tenacity to hold on like Jacob and not to let go until you've changed our character. We're living in that time, oh Lord where the mystery of iniquity is reaching its maturity. So we know, Lord, that the mystery of godliness will reach its maturity as well. And we want to be a part of that number. My appeal today, my appeal first and foremost is to those who want to rededicate their life to Christ today and say, God, I want to spend more time in your word. God, I want to get the victory over my sins. God, I want the power to sacrifice the love of the world. If that's you, I want you to stand with me as we continue to pray. Stand with me. Stand with me. You want to be a sheep this morning. Praise God. Praise God. 